everyone. All right, let's get started. So our first speaker today is Nemanja Kalofer from UC Davis, and he will tell us about uh, some new approach to cosmological constant problem. You just see how this works. The center for the lecture on the yeah. That's it. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be back in Madrid. You know, hopefully this festival that we have been subject to for all these years is now going to end. So we can see each other in person more and more. Okay, that would be great. I'm going to talk about some ideas that I've been developing. Well, there are three papers that are published. I'll, I'll tell you privately the kind of ordeals I, I had with, with, with the referees. Wow, but they're published. The last paper is with Alex Westphal, and there is also more in preparation. The, the discussions that I'm having, I, I have to credit my collaborators, people I'm learning from, Guido Diamico, John Turning, Albion Lawrence, a few other people here and there. Now, I've given this talk at a few places already, and some people have heard the previous version here. And thinking about it, I've decided to actually kind of uh, upgrade the talk with some preliminary material and actually skip some of the technical stuff. If you want to see some of the stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll flash the stuff I'm skipping that, that I don't want to spend the time in order not to go over time and so on. There is a talk that, that John Turning recorded of the previous version that you can find on YouTube. So if you just search for my name, it will pop up. There I discuss more of the technical stuff I'll skip. So let's get going without further ado. Now, before we start, so well, well, I, I figure maybe. We just have a brief discussion. What does it actually mean to solve the cosmological problem, even though this sounds like a trivial kind of non sequitur question? And the reason I want to mention a few things about this is that you see, I, I'm I, in the in the previous variants of this talk and in the papers, I was very very reluctant to claim that I have found a full solution to the cosmological constant problem. I thought that I had found effectively a mechanism that can contribute to the construction of such a solution that does not involve entropic reason. Okay? But uh, outlines a very interesting limit, a very interesting version of a relaxation mechanism based on the emission on, on this of membranes that has so far and surprisingly so been missed in the literature. Okay? And uh, trying to understand how to push this forward, I went to this reference by Orczynski. It's actually a little bit haphazard, a little bit disorganized, and yet there are some very interesting comments in there that you need to spend some time, you know, digesting. And basically, he talks about various aspects of the problem that is very useful to, to know, okay? And uh, in light of this, I thought I understood something, so I want to share that with you here. So what does it actually take to solve the cosmological constant problem? Typical attempt to address it this is either to constrain it, to, and for, for the moment, I'm going to ignore the current cosmic acceleration, okay? Just imagine this is, you know, 1997, before, uh, you know, all the supernovae observations converging to say that the universe isn't Exactly, possibly exactly the uh, Minkowski, but maybe the city. So ignore it. Imagine, imagine that cosmological constant is zero. Well, it's small anyway. We need to get rid of the big part. The the usual approach was to either try to constrain it to nothing by imposing a symmetry. Okay, one example being supersymmetry. Another example being conformal symmetry. But the trouble is that those symmetries are nowhere near observable moral it seems. And so it doesn't seem that they can be operational in getting rid of the issue. Another idea was to get it to smoothly adjust via modification of something in the either Q theory sector or gravitational sector, etc., where the cosmological, what, what would be the cosmological constant term actually does develop some kind of time evolution and relaxes, okay? And there is all kinds of technical problems with this as well. If you have stuff, if you have, if you have extra stuff that relaxes the logical constant, it probably needs to couple to all the usual method. Then that can induce long range forces. 
and uh, lead to conflicts with, uh, with bounds and observations. It can also happen that uh, you suffer from what's called the MP universe problem because this mechanism that relaxes the cosmological constant may need to be dominant forever, meaning that once it finally relaxes the cosmological constant in the process of doing it, it relax everything to nothing and you end up with an empty universe where, you know, obviously not fitting what you observe. In some sense, actually, the simplest adjustments use conformally coupled scalar, which effectively what it does is in the process of relaxing cosmological constant, it relaxes all other scales in the universe, such as the standard model, masses, and so on and so forth, down to zero, and that again is not what you observe. So, in some sense, why is all this happening? What's the you know what's the problem? Well, you know, here is maybe I'm going to be a little bit shall we say controversial here, but I would like to argue that actually, even though it's just one number, cosmological constant problem is not a UV problem or an IR problem or any specific scale problem. It's an all scale problem. In some sense, because of the equivalent principle of general relativity and the fact that virtual energy gravitates, cosmological constant is kind of all, all hands on deck type of thing. Which probes and senses to the presence of everything that has a rest mass. Ignore, ignore the UV part contribution. Ignore what, you know, for the moment. Okay. We usually focus on the fact, oh, you know, the cosmological constant receives the contribution, it goes as a cut to the force. Okay, cut, we don't really know what the UV completion of the real world is or, or, or of gravity for that matter, etc. Forget it, okay, for the moment. Imagine you just get rid of it by, I don't know, team red, even though that's a cheat, but still, okay? The issue is that there is all kinds of massive particles in the universe. Quarks, you know, tau, mu, electron, neutrino, etc. And all of them, every single one of them has to gravitate. Well, with neutrinos, it's actually, we, we haven't really been able to put a bunch of neutrinos on a on a weight scale to measure how they gravitate, but let's say they all gravitate in the minimal versions of the theory anyway. And it seems that in fact, none of them, except maybe neutrino, okay, contributes to the cosmological constant. Somehow something gets rid of all of these. And in fact, this log dependence makes it even more difficult because you know, if you cancel everything at a certain scale and then the scale of the regulator changes, you, you, you offset the balance, it kind of gets complicated because we've seen that you need an adjustment mechanism for each individual particle, so, okay? Which, which, which is kind of tricky. And, and there is interesting history behind it, but actually, in some sense, already Powell seems to have known this, even though he has never published it. In 1920s, according to this reference, Powell has calculated the loop induced cosmological constant from the electron and quit. Ah, interesting. It, this is really true. If this really existed in the world, we wouldn't see farther than the moon. That would be the end of the world. In fact, I think the distance was like 30 kilometers. I don't remember, okay, what the horizon side would be. Okay. Now, here is the perhaps controversial part. Um, I think that maybe in a sense, even though we usually put the Higgs mass, you know, the, the hierarchy problem and the cosmological constant problem in the same bin. They're a bit different. The Higgs mass where we observe it is near the top of the spectrum of the observed particles. Okay. Um, if there is nothing else in the world, as some people seem to claim, you know, there are people who think that standard models shouldn't be completed any more than it is, it's already completed. If there is no heavier stuff in the universe, maybe that's okay. You know, dark matter could be, I don't know, axions. There are, of course, problems with inflation, etc. But okay, let's ignore. It. All right, cosmological constant is less forgiving. Okay, you, you know you can't really mess with it because of the equivalence principle. I get what you're saying is that the hierarchy problem is the problem of BSM precisely. Why the CC problem is a standard model precisely. Perfect. <laughs> exactly. Okay. It simply sees everything that gravitates, and you know, we seem to think that a lot of stuff gravitates, and actually, local tests of equivalent principle tell us that they do, right? I mean, electron needs to gravitate pretty much the same as the proton in order not to mess up the weaker coordinates, okay? 
And if they all gravitate the same way, why don't they gravitate in the cosmological constant? What got rid of it? So if we don't really want to mess too much with locality, you know, quantum field theory seems to really work with short distances, right? Really well. So let, let's not abandon it right away. What what could we do? So one possibility that is still open, I think, is you know, sort of the, the tooth of time eventually destroys everything by rot and decay. So let's look for some way to get cosmological constant to rot away, to decay away, to disappear spontaneously. How do we do that? Well, maybe we can we can do so. I wanted to do the little I mean, animations. I guess you guys had to convert it into the PDF, which is fine. Uh, imagine imagine instead of continuous variation, continuous adjustment, smooth adjustment, that there is some discrete mechanism for getting rid of the cosmological constant value, because there is something that you can discre discreetly emit, emit in steps. That every time you emit, it changes the properties of space and time in some region where this emission occurred, and reduces the cosmo cosmological constant by some finite amount. Now, so for the moment, ignore the green lines here. Focus only on the black lines. Imagine that these levels, you know, in a simple theory, these, these jumps, these levels will be, well, you know, the idea obviously is that there is some sort of membranes that you're emitting that gravitate like a cosmological constant locally, but can't change, okay? And that uh, as they change, they produce bubbles of space inside which, okay, the, the flux of some gauge field that is sorted by these membranes is reduced. And because of this reduction of the flux, the effective value of the cosmological constant in the region inside the membrane is in fact smaller, and so on and so forth. The trouble with that usually, and this goes back to the you know, classic idea, these, these I, I think really truly when you think about it, and when you actually finally go through it and digest it's kind of seminal papers, very insightful papers, but complicated papers to understand, by Brown and Title going back in 1988. Okay. The problem with this is that if you want to solve the cosmological constant problem, okay, by emitting a fixed single kind of membrane, okay, because the levels are fixed and equidistant, then to come close to lambda equal to zero, okay, you need to take this gap in between the levels, namely to, to fix the charge and the tension of the membranes, okay, to be either tiny. Brown and Title were in the end of that long paper that was published in 88 in nuclear physics B, take the charges that, 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 that are carried by the membranes to be 10 to the minus 120 in the plant image. They write this comment at the very, very last sentence of the paper before the appendices. But when you are reading this paper, you have to keep in mind that, that they, they wrote this paper in a way a, a causally, okay? Because that assumption that the cosmological constant is discharged by the membranes with tiny charges is built into the narrative of the paper. Okay. So, so I, the, the problem is if you took if you if you took the 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 the, the gap to be larger than ten to the minus one twenty, then you will have to fine tune your initial initial position because the fact that. In it, that, that really the theory effectively has super selection sectors that are, that are characterized by the initial value of the cosmological constant you start with. And then you just discharge with the finite steps. If you want that to come close to zero, okay, then of course you need to start with something which is close to the in integer number of charges plus zero to start with, or else it will fail. If you make the gap tiny, like Brown and Tycho going do, okay. Then what's going to happen is that you're almost invariably going to end up with the empty universe problem because the discharges will continue as long as there is any cosmological constant. And by the time that you come close to zero, okay, this, this will actually, you know, just prevent you from ever repeating the universe by anything. And they say so, effectively, that they do have an empty universe problem there. Okay? Now, an alternative, actually, exists. It's going to sound a little bit controversial, but it's an old idea kind of fast forward than here, that you have multiple sets of membranes. If you have multiple sets of membranes, their charges don't necessarily have to have 
the same values, and in particular, okay, they could be such that the steps they produce, and I'm going to say this carefully, they, they have, can be such that the steps they produce in relaxing the cosmological constant, the gaps that they generate in the spectrum of possible cosmological constants, are mutually incommensurate, meaning that the ratio is an irrational number. The simplest version of this mechanism that I will go over will impose that the charges themselves are mutually rational, but I will comment on how that can be changed. And also that by itself is not necessarily a problem. It seems there is a built up expectation you can't have, okay, irrational, mutually rational charges in a theory. This is derived from ideas about how quantum gravity does not tolerate global symmetries. And there is a concern dating back to a paper by Banks, Stein, and Seibert from 91 called Irrational Axiom, where such, such an example has been displayed. However, in order to have such a problem as they count in, okay, as they encounter, you need to have some scalar field that mixes in between these charges and in fact can then turn into some sort of a, you know, strange beast. There is no such scalar, scalar field here, okay? These are just discrete volumes and there is no emergent global symmetry as a consequence, no matter what, but I will also tell you how you don't, in fact, even need necessarily the irrational, mutually irrational charges per se. So in this case, if you do have these steps to be mutually irrational, then what can happen is that in the process of relaxing towards the zero, <laughs> there will be at some point due to irrationality, some intermediate levels like this, where going down toward, you start in the black tower with some initial value, you get to this point, and then from this point, you can take it's like a fork in the road. Okay. You can choose to continue on the black tower, okay, and miss the sufficiently small terminal value of lambda, or you can flip up to the green tower and end up right where you need to be because of the fact that you know you've made so many steps that, that due to the repetition of its irrationalities, the mutually large integer difference got wiped out. Obviously, in order for that to happen, there has to be a mechanism that is going to let you choose this fork in the road. And the mechanism is just the standard quantum mechanics. Effectively, it's kernel inflation. Okay? If you're having all of these bubbles at a very high initial curvature, all of them will be produced no matter what. So really, I have a multiverse. I have a landscape type construction here, and I have a mechanism that operates in the landscape. And so you may ask, okay, so what's the difference from this in the standard landscape? And I will tell you there's a difference due to this unforeseen circumstance and this 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 limiting case that was not observed previously. Okay. In order to get to the value where you want to be, you don't need the appropriate. Okay. So that's the thing. Moreover, all of these these charges happen at high energies. The step in the green tower and the black tower between the adjacent black and green lines are big. Okay. So this difference is a large number, okay? This means all the adjustment to nearly zero value happens at high energy. And then this mechanism stops because the universe, the, the curvature in that region where the number is, right? Okay, essentially reduces below the value at, uh, beyond, above which the, 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 the tunneling process is producing membranes, producing bubbles are fast. They, they eventually become very slow, and the universe with the time value of lambda becomes metastable. Moreover, I will show you how, in fact, actually lambda equal to zero is, in fact, a dynamical attractor. You get to it, and you what if you can occasionally get negative values, these universes die. And so, in fact, actually what happens is that this is an accumulation point, quantum accumulation point. So the idea is that this decay, encounter, or rather utilizing this survey in heaven of the different towers, okay, actually goes through the relaxation through a dense set of states by basically Brownian drift, quantum mechanical Brownian drift, a mutually large step, but by utilizing different towers, producing values which can come up with rather close to zero. The where is all this coming from? Well, I'm gonna just tell you. The gravity basically has latent degrees of freedom that can be turned on. 
These latent degrees of freedom are precisely the UV sensitive parameters in the gravitational action, the Planck scale and the and the and the, the counter terms, if you like. Think of the counter terms that you need to renormalize them Planck and lambda, not as just some random numbers that are fixed forever, but having their own intrinsic dynamics and receiving contributions from various fluxes of certain forms. Okay. So when you play with this, you eventually uncover. Make sure that they are, you know, shall we say, that there is a way to, intro, to do this in producing new game symmetries, which prevent the emergence of local degrees of freedom that can mess things up by producing large, large long range forces and messing up the phenomenology at low scale. So, effectively, the GR action is, you know, it, this in a sense, could have been written by David Hilbert back in 1915, but wasn't. Well, I don't know why. Okay. Um, the way to, to play with this, I, I, this is these are the slides that, that I'll skip. Basically, there is a way to promote the, these dynamics of degrees of freedom into sorry, the, the, the what's normally taken to be dimensional parameters of GR into dynamical degrees of freedom, uh, introducing forms and charges, varying the actions, playing with it, getting getting to conclude that really you have infinitely many degrees of well infinitely many discrete, discrete degrees of freedom in that or rather states in that so there is really gr really describes infinitely many universes okay sort of like a fluid flow but i don't want to go into the detail of this instead imagine you know, all of those slides all of these technicalia eventually leads to this as the effective action that you can deploy Utilizing magnetic dual variables to the four forms that I splashed before. Okay, so this is this is the standard GR as it stands in terms of these these variables. Now, however, think of kappa and lambda and lowercase lambda not as fixed numbers, but as fields which are restricted by these topological field theories to be locally constant. Okay. If you vary, for example, the action with respect to this three form, okay, and ignore the sources or decouple the membranes by taking the limit when the tensions go to infinity, okay, so you can't you can't nucleate anything. Then varying this action, this part of the action with respect to A, tells you that d mu lambda is equal to zero. So lambda is locally constant. But now, if you have charges with finite tensions. That constant can change by the nucleation of the membrane that carries that charge. You don't have a kinetic term for the three forms? No, but I'll comment it for you. I'll, I'll comment why and how that's actually okay. Okay? I, I'm going to ignore it. I'll just tell you as a preamble, even if I introduce that kinetic term, as long as I restrict it to sub Planckian value and take this kappa to be a further n one. That kinetic term and all other higher powers, in fact, are completely negligible and change not taking the story. Uh, so I'll start with this. Now, what's the strategy here? Ignore real cosmology for now. Imagine that the universe is basically a locally maximally symmetric space, the citero radius, Euclidianize the action, Euclidianize geometry. And simply study the, pro the nucleation processes, you know, by constructing instructions, which is really the same classical limit of quantum gravity, essentially following what was set in motion by Coleman and also later by Brown and Dyboy. So, what we want to find out is first what, what happens with the dynamical parameters that control the features of the universe, and, you know, geometrically by analytic continuation of the solution from Euclidean to Minkowski energies, okay? And secondly, what, uh, what, what, you know, what, what's the terminal value? And if there is an attractor mechanism or not, and when does this attractor mechanism mm -hmm. operate? So the scale of the, of the tension of the membranes? It's sub -planking. It's sub -planking. I think, you keep, let's say that for, for the sake of argument, it's very high. On God scale. Okay. It's a high scale anyway. Although that could be tunable, so there might be interesting things if it's lower, but I'm not sure. So basically, what I really want to focus on is the, the differences relative to ground title void. Now, 
In general, when you have both the membranes with finite tensions, God scale or, or their amount, okay, for the for the for the two systems, notice here, okay, the, the membrane charge under A relax lambda. Okay. The membrane charge under B relax the Planck scale. What I'm going to do for simplicity in, in the in one of the papers that I plus the reference to, the long paper, which was published in PRD. I have studied both the processes which relax lambda and the Planck scale. Okay. The the for simplicity's sake, I'm going to freeze the Planck scale by imagining that the, the, the PB is tend to infinity so that those membranes are not touched. Or rather not produced and M Planck is not touched. There are subtleties with M Planck, some some arguments are given. I don't really want to, because of time, we can, you know, I'm happy to answer privately or not privately, but, you know, in the question period. So I'm only going to keep the membranes which can discharge lambda. M1 considered fixed. That's what I mean by these little, you know, kappa squared being crossed out. So here, here is the mathematics of this. Okay. Euclidean decitter or anti -decitor, is a section of a sphere, four sphere, or what's called a four horror sphere, meaning you know, section of a Lobachevsky space. Actually, let me be let me become Lobachevsky polya geometry in 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 four dimensions. The gravitational equations, the independent gravitational equations away from the membrane reduced to a single equation, which is basically the Euclidean version of the Friedman equation with a single source. Which is the cosmological constant that controls the work factor. Okay. Here I'm just focusing in the equations, I'm focusing on, on sphere slash initially the seated spaces, including the seated spaces. In the case of ADF, you would have promote this, you would replace this unity by you would flip the sign of this. Okay. The boundary condition is due to the presence of the membranes, because of the fact that the, the, the plant scale is. Is frozen by taking the TB to infinity. So punch scale doesn't change. Notice K out, K in are the same. The, the membrane charges change the cosmological the value of the cosmological constant counter term in finite steps. And of course, so this is the analog of the junction condition for the for the electric field on the interface between two two. Two dielectrics with ordinary electromagnetism. Okay, this is the same equation. And this equation here controls the drunk in the work factor between the interior and exterior of the membrane. And that's the easel junction condition, which actually is the analog of the boundary condition for electromagnetism in the case of gravity. Here is what we are doing geometrically. What we do is we start with some parent the sitter geometry. Which is a sphere of a smaller radius, let's say, because of the fact that the radius is inversely proportional to the volume of the cosmological constant. So, bigger cosmological constant means smaller sphere. This is the descendant geometry, okay, the offspring, inside which I'm focusing on this example, this ordering, because these are predominant processes. They're, they're the ones that are more, most likely, okay. Where the, the, the radius is larger because the cosmological constant got smaller. Then what we do to perform the construction of the instance, when we perform some surgery here, we start at the in the in the in the parent geometry. Okay, we start with the whole sphere. Then we start moving along a which one is it? A longitude line from the, from the north pole to the south pole until we get to a certain latitude line. Okay, whose Perimeter is fixed by the boundary conditions. Similarly, we take the offspring geometry, we perform the similar process, we move to the latitude line, which is not at the same latitude as the original line because the radii are different. Instead, the boundary condition tells us that this perimeter has to be exactly the same as this one, the dashed lines. Okay, and then we slice it up, you know, take a take a, I don't know. Whatever Jedi lightsaber and cut the sphere along the dark line, cut this one, and then glue this piece 
uh, which one? This piece, okay, the bottom of this one and the top here. Okay, and that's gonna be the instance of, that tells us how the parent geometry, okay, right here, okay. Now, actually, there are two possibilities to do this. This is discussed in a lot of detail by Brown and Dyfelboim, okay? Because in principle, okay, depending on, you see, the, the point is the Friedman equation is a quadratic equation. When you solve it to match to the boundary conditions, which are linear equations, you take a square root and you get a sign plus or minus of the, of the square root. And that sign that, that you pick, okay, is, like a like a like a discrete chart which is conserved. And what happens is that it tells you whether you should stop. You see, the point is that on a sphere, you have for a given perimeter two different latitude lines, and that sign tells you whether when you pick your latitude lines, you include the equator of the initial sphere or not. Okay. So you have two options, and you can actually instead of cutting here, you can cut there and perform similar. Surgery here and glue them in a different way. Mathematically, this means the following. You take possible parent geometries. These are initial Euclidean deciders. These are initial Euclidean anti deciders. These are terminal geometries, the, 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 the offspring, the descendants, you know, the children. Okay. And you solve those boundary conditions, those equations that I've shown you previously. They're actually it's surprisingly simple in the case when you have only the linear term in the in the flux present, and you can solve them in close one and split them up. Now, here is the interesting thing: what geometries are allowed or not is controlled by this piece here, okay? Which is basically the ratio of charge to the tension squared in the units of time one. Now. This is different than what you encounter when you have dominant kinetic terms. So this is for higher powers. In the case when you have like f square and no linear term, okay, this kappa square, kappa to the fourth, which is palm scale to the fourth, this piece is replaced by two powers of palm scale times one power of the environment flux. Which means that the boundary, boundary term is dependent on the flux. And that makes a big difference in what's possible and what's not possible, and I'll get to it shortly. Okay? I'm just warning, you know, putting it on a flat, saying what's important here. Why? What's going on? The important thing is when you refocus on this piece that controls what possible transitions can happen, it's this ratio. That controls whether the term in parentheses ever gets to have its sign flipped or not. If this ratio is big, then by just in, in particular bigger than unity, then one possible outcome of the term in parentheses will be a positive number and the other will be a negative number. Okay. If on the other hand, this number is chosen initially to be less than unity. Then, in fact, no matter what, both terms retain the same value. Moreover, if you start with a fixed ratio q over t squared, then, in fact, that ratio never changes, no matter what the initial value of the logical constant is, no matter what state you start with. In other words, the, the, the dynamical regimes where q over t squared is less than 1 and greater than 1 are completely separated from each other. When the, in the case when you have f squared, and this term involves the flux, that is not true. In one dynamical regime can continue to evolve in the other by the reduction of the flux by the emission of membrane. In fact, not can, will. This makes a lot of difference. So this is the possible, doesn't show very well, but that's okay, I'll tell you what it is. These are the, the allowed transitions, okay? This is. The, the diagram is, the, this, this, this picture is, you know, I call it Bedecker because Bedecker was the first famous company that was published in tour guides back in 1930s in Germany, you know, like, like city maps and so on and so forth. So this is your map of the possible instant on. The possible instant on that are relevant to us, to us that basically, you know, tell us how the, the system space relaxes into the system space of uh, 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 smaller curvature. 
are these basically these six diagrams. And these six are in, all of them are encountered by brown type of worm. And the, 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 their formal structure is the same, except that in this case, due to the absence of the quadratic, or rather the, the, the irrelevance of the quadratic piece, I'm now going to tell you it's irrelevant of the quadratic piece. It's never dominant. Depending on the, on the value of this, the little q is the ratio of q, q over t squared in Planck units. These, these six split up into two groups, one of two and one of four. If q is less than minus one, only these two transitions are possible. All others are excluded. If q is greater than one, then these four go and all and the other two are excluded. It's about 10 minutes left. Okay, I'll speed up a little. Here is now the explanation of what changes. You see, in case you have flux dependent, the parameter that controls which of these instances are possible, it's actually controlled by the slope of the tangent to this curve, which is telling you how the cosmological constant total depends on the track. In the presence of f squared, the total cosmological constant depends on n squared q squared and n squared n times q is the flux. So you have plus squared. So the tangent obviously changes depending where you are. If you do not want to fine tune your initial cosmological constant, and you want to have a natural a result, natural outcome of relaxing it towards terminal value of zero, what you want to do is you want to take this in integration constant to be large. You know, this is, for example, Busso-Polchensky type thing. You want to take a large cosmological constant, not fine tuned to tiny value initially, which needs to be compensated by a huge flux, which eventually gets reduced to a less huge flux, which cancels that large initial constant, which means you're always in the regime of large fault. The problem with large fault is they don't have natural attractor terminal value because they tend to let your universe utilize fast instances, the four instances I showed you, they're fast transitions, and they tend to want to jump to negative values of lambda. And it is because of this that to prevent negative values of lambda to be generic and stop at lambda close to zero, this is why we invoke entropic entity. Okay. In the case if you have dominant linear term and these quadratic pieces are negligible, the slope is fixed. Okay. It's one value or the other. If you take the slope to be small, you are always in the linear regime where you will naturally go to zero and stop there, accumulating that without ever needing to invoke a property. That's a big difference. <coughs> Why is this happening? Blah, blah, blah. There is some mathematics here. When you construct the action that controls the rate of discharge of a membrane, what you're doing is you're using the bounce action as per Coleman's prescription. The bounce action means you take your instant and that you constructed. Well, I, I have it on the next slide, so I won't bother drawing it. Okay. And then from the instant and you constructed, you subtract the parent action. It's the difference between the initial action and the instant on action that controls the, the nucleation rate. Okay. And what I'm going to say now intuitively is actually coded by the fact that when you compute it numerically, blah, 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 the, the total bounce action depends on these sigmas, the, oh, sorry, these zetas, and those are those discrete charges which tell you which, which, which sign of the square root in the construction you have to take. Here is the bottom line. This is the example of the common fast, you know, gold instant on that I want to exclude by taking the opposite inequality for this q. But here is guys using it just to illustrate what happens. To construct this instant, okay, the rule when q is greater than one, okay, tells you that you take you take the, the parent action, okay, which is to be computed over this large residual sphere. This is the, the, the descendant. This is the, the membrane that was nucleated and in the interior, in the red regime, okay? You have a smaller value of cosmological constant. That's why this cap is kind of flattened on top of the North Pole. K 
Okay, so what happens here is now you need to subtract from this, okay? The action over the whole blue sphere to get a bounce, which means that if you do that, then this region will get canceled by the contribution from the parent, and the net bounce action will be the difference of the integral over this region to minus the integral over a similar region, but with slightly different curvature in the blue region. Because of the fact that these are small regions, they're close to the North Pole, these actions over these small areas will be proportional to the perimeter of the membrane as opposed to the total area. And therefore, they do not really care about the background cosmological constants. These actions are the, giving you the usual limit that, that, that you know when you study tunneling and so on and so forth. And these are, these are the past guys. The reason is they settle down to a value which doesn't care about the background with logical constant. These are the ones I call the green in front of the Q is less than one. Here, the, for these values, you construct the instant from different ways. That's the trick about whether you include the equator or not that I described earlier, okay, when you're gluing these things together. So when you construct the bounds, you're now subtracting it over, you're subtracting a huge blue sphere. This piece cancels out, but what remains in the normalization gives you an integral over the huge region of the complementary volume to this, which has a background initial volume cosmological constant not being canceled and appearing in the denominator of the bounce action, which has a pole when lambda is equal to zero. So it means that as you're relaxing towards lambda equal to zero, Every subsequent process with smaller lambda is going to be slower. And in particular, the decay rate that depends on this exponentially has an essential singularity of lambda equal to zero, which is where it wants to go and stop. So the trick now is that you are basically, you start with somewhere here in this region, and then you start jumping in discrete steps. <coughs> and when you get into the yellow region, okay, there you can have one more jump, and some of those jumps can take you into the negative values. If you get into the negative values, so one, then you want to make a real universe. That universe is going to decay when you put even a tiny, tiny amount of matter in there, okay? Because of the fact that it is going to be gravitationally bound, it's going to implode on itself. These transitions can take long, and the closer you get to the value of lambda equal to zero, the longer it takes. Actually, lambda equal to zero is absolutely the same. The question is, how do you get close to lambda equal to zero because without fine-tuning the initial value? So this is basically the mathematical formulation of the problem. You have some initial value. You have some discrete number of steps that you change it by. And you don't want to make the charge tiny. So, you know, either, either you should make the charge tiny to get rid of the initial value of lambda not with that degree of precision, okay? Or you tune, tune the value of lambda not as this time. So, so the trick is introduce now a second set of membrane, okay? A second set that involves, which is literally a replica of the previous set, but with one key difference here. QA hat and QA previously are mutually rational. Then there is a theorem in the theory of you know irrational numbers, which tells you that in fact, if you take the terms to be mutually rational, you can take their sum to be arbitrarily close to any number in the real plane. The statement is that the set of irrational numbers is dense in the set of reals. Okay. In other words, Basically, set of irrational numbers has accumulation points outside of itself. It's not complete. Its closure is the set of real numbers. So you want to go close to zero statistically, but eventually you stop because of the fact that you have this attractive point. Sometimes you overshoot and you go down. You go down to below zero, but those universes stop. They die. If you get close to zero, but not quite, okay? By rare processes, nevertheless, you can go back up and get yourself recycled. Essentially searching for the trajectory. And those that search for the trajectory that takes you close to zero will take a long time 
but it never stops. And so you're going to find in, in some generic called metaverse values, you will find the terminal values tend to paper exponentially, one day equal to zero. No profit principle, nothing. Now, here is the comment about the higher powers and also irrational behavior. I mean, first of all, okay, you may induce the higher powers by, by, by uh, you know, the corrections, higher, higher order corrections. And these coefficients that you get will not be universal. There is no reason for them to be universal. Okay? So as a result, the presence of higher order corrections, even if these are exactly the same in the two towers, these, the presence of higher order corrections can lead to effective inertia knowledge. Even if the charges Q and Q, QA and QA hat are the same, the high powers that involve them may not be. Okay. Secondly, these coefficients here in the leading order can may be different too. So even again, if the targets are the same, their contributions to cosmological constant don't have to be. So the bottom line is when you have two towers, okay, then precisely that picture from the beginning can be realized. That you go down following one tower and then somewhere, you know, somewhere in the midst that you switch and you go with the other tower and eventually land right from zero. So here is the switch. You will land right from zero. And once you land right to zero or close to zero, you can make forever then. Okay? But this happened, this, this was selected when the universe was still young and hot. In the intervening period, once once the logical constant got, got you know, discharged in that particular bubble that is inside the sequence, next the sequence of bubbles, okay, that region will just sort of sit there and they could be populated by subsequent inflation and so on and so forth. The point is that when you estimate the, if you, if you estimate the partition function in the semi-classical limit using the DK that you calculated, you end up finding out surprisingly what seems to be the distribution for the values of the logical constant in terminal universe, which was proposed by Hawking and by Baum back in 84, where they, they argue that in fact actually such such an essential singularity present in the partition function is precisely what favored time value of lambda, but they wanted to base it. This result on, on wormhole calculus, which was which turned out to be unreliable. Here there is no wormhole, there is nothing. I'm, I'm gonna close up in a few. Notice also that this is this has been selected by you know dynamics rather than by anthropics, because only these green instances are operational. The gold instances that mess it up are now impossible once you get to the regime Q is less than one. Ah, here is the empty. This this in some sense re reminds one of this old idea of Abbott. Abbott had a very clever idea where he wanted to get rid of the logical constant by adding a scalar field with a linear potential, which was degenerate with the cosmological constant, and wanted it to slide. If you like, this was like relaxium before the relaxium, okay, back in 85. And then he wanted to trap the terminal value of the scalar near the terminal value of lambda equal to zero. And that worked with a cosmological constant, but just like Brown and Teichelboy led to the empty universe problem because this field was dominating all of the way down to zero. So if you wanted the universe to reheat, you can't reheat above the current value of the Hubble parameter. So the mechanism I described avoids it because it goes down this slope in discrete large step. It gets to the right volume by exploitation of the large phase space rather than by design. You can have inflation in principle again because of the fact that these jumps are large. Uh, you can also have these recycling steps. In fact, just for inflation, I'll just give you one possible idea that's in progress. In a certain sense, you know, this is this I find very interesting because actually, with a, with a, with, a, with well, current data like very flattened potential, there is a monodromy potential which includes flattening corrections due to strong coupling effects that was calculated originally by the Wolski, Lawrence, and Roberts, and then repeated in a simplified, well, simplified to some extent by Nomura, Watari, and Yamazaki. You basically get these potentials that depend on the field as an inverse power. Once the field is at large displacement from the minimum. But these 
powers also, because this is a monodromy, they also involve the background flux correction, okay, that you can essentially end up, when you reproduce it, you get something like a discretized hybrid inflation. If your initial value is somewhere up here, okay, then what's going to happen is that the dominant process for relaxing the value of the potential will be via membrane emission, okay, because the large value of the logical constant will slow down the input on the slope even more. And then you're relaxing and relaxing and relaxing until you get to the right branch, where the cosmological constant now is close to its terminal tiny value. And then the field actually realizes, because the background value of the cosmological constant is small, the background value of the Hubble parameter is, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, not dominated by cosmological constant, but by the field itself, by the potential flow. And so the field can actually now start slowly rolling by itself towards the minimum, inflating in the process, repeating, and so on and so forth. What's the current dark energy? Now here I'm going to make maybe the most argumentative claim that in fact actually using this type of mechanism, I think I can actually, you know, you're always wiser with wisdom after the fact and in hindsight you see more. I didn't see this before. I think now I can make a claim that this can actually completely solve the cosmological constant, even with the dark energy currently, albeit not in our world. So this is the, the, I don't know how to do it in our world, but I can do it, I think, in this hypothetical little universe, which had no phase transitions after inflation, except maybe all the way down to a tiny scale when, when neutrino gets them up. So imagine a world which is kind of like ours, but not quite. If the point is the following, if you have all of the phase transitions in the universe, in the standard model, whatever goes for the standard model in this different universe, happen at some very high scale. So all of the masses are due to some, you know, near UV cutoff effect. The whatever they produce for the cosmological constant can in principle get discharged by the membrane nucleation in the search for the minimum value, which is favored, namely one day equal to zero. This wants to get you to zero. After that, you have inflation, but you know, you are in many, many bubbles, the cosmological constant will be in more bubbles than anywhere else. Exponentially more bubbles, the cosmological constant will be zero. But then of course the question is, how do you ever get the universe afterwards to not get a cosmological constant to be zero? And maybe a possibility is, you see, in this region after inflation, the, 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 the membranes are not really produced dramatically. They can be produced, but it takes an awfully long time for that to happen. So it is possible therefore to actually induce a terminal small value of cosmological constant if you have a very late phase transition, maybe the one that gives no dream of the up. I don't know how to do that yet. And moreover, I don't really know how to, to if I have phase transitions here at various scale, the real problem. I think actually this is a, maybe the most challenging problem for the cosmological constant problem. And you know, to be fair, okay, I don't really think that anybody has given it a lot of thought we all, you know, except Chaba and his colleagues who have been basically thinking a lot about getting rid of cosmological constant also generated by phase transitions by arranging for special dynamics within the phase transitions itself, which I find very interesting. So maybe some kind of chimera can be built along those lines. So anyway, let me stop here. So what are the takeaway points? So I want to argue that in fact, really, okay, I mean, this goes, I think this is related to the, these ideas involving something called unimodular gravity, which people have made claims about and so on and so forth. In my opinion, unimodular gravity is really not that different from that. Well, general relativity is the way how it's usually thought actually doesn't really exist, of course, except as a mathematical simplification of bigger theory. I think the proper general relativity is to be thought of as a theory that locally looks like GR, but with M, Planck, and Lambda as three parameters. There are infinitely many of them. In the classical limit, they are parametrizing super selection sector to the bigger theory. But when you turn on the dynamics that can change these parameters, such as the membrane nucleation, okay, they are not, no more super selection sector, but in fact, 
can transition from one into the other. And you have a bigger theory, which is truly a landscape. So, you know, I think landscape, this kind of landscape is there, invariable, unavoidable. Um, but it doesn't have to be entropic. It's not clear to me that it must be entropic. I know people have argued that maybe you can get rid of the ultraviolet for a contribution to cosmological most non entropically, but to explain the cosmic acceleration now, you must have entropics because of the neutrino accident with the mass scale. I'm not sure that's necessary. Maybe it's just an accident that you get D that is, uh, you know, that, that can be right now, which is a million electron volt because something gave neutrino such a mass. The, go, the good points about this is that, you know, the, the system is unstable. That's a good thing if you want to get rid of the cosmological runs, the decay. I mean, you modify the theory, but not local, okay? And the theory was kind of asking to be modified, if you ask me, okay? So this can relax the cosmological runs. The, the system is also can be pretty long-lived, which is also good because in principle, inflation can work, okay? And moreover, I told you I froze the Planck scale. I also ignored the variation of the Higgs well. As we know, there were papers not long ago, but in fact, even Higgs well was considered to be a landscape variable. And, you know, one can include it and ask more general questions. So let me stop here. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So you said that this is giving them to can relax. The CC close to zero. Yeah. Zero in that factor. Yeah. How close to zero can you be? And how long would it take? For 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 to get close to zero, okay, ignoring this transition, it wants to be really close to zero, exponential, exponential time. Okay. Much tinier than what you see. So what you what you see now, that's the challenge. This is one way to address this challenge, but not in our universe, because of the of the fact that our universe. In principle, has gate phase transitions at a TV and at a GV as well that may have produced a larger cosmological Now, how long it takes? So, so, if you have a CCD phase transition, why can it, can you not have another decay after that? I, I may, I just don't know how to do it in detail. Okay. That's what I need to do. If, 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 that's exactly the challenge. If I knew how to get rid of the QCD space transition, okay? okay. That's always the hard part. That's always the hard part. Right? The thing is that this will get rid of all the UV, okay? Now, how long does it take is somewhat of a misnomer. It may take a very long time or a very short time, depending on how quickly that sequence of the, you know, right, uh, the, 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 the right, right, right sequence of bubbles of nucleations is found by your initial condition. However, you see, it really doesn't matter because in the universe that we explore, Okay, we are counting time backwards. Okay, from now to some high scale, in fact, only up to nucleosynthesis, all of the stuff at earlier times, severely a hypothesis at this point. Okay, so let's say that we accept the hypothesis that the universe is practically semi classical all the way to the end of inflation. Okay, what preceded that semi classical last, you know, last 60 defaults of inflation and whatnot? Can in principle, you know, if you are if you're in the regime of the, of the deeply quantum eternally inflating universe and whatnot, the very notion of time as we now think of it is actually even irrelevant. Because you're hoping, you are resurrecting itself in some universe with high courage and so on and so forth. So you have it's not that the, the, the time really that matters until after inflation, okay? But rather the fact that you're sort of hopping around and exploring until you run into the right possibility. Okay, now what would you, how would you observe this? Okay, you would want to find a possible signature such as domain walls. Okay, there's, 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 what do they call them? Footprints, fingerprints, or whatever in the CMB. Okay, things like that, maybe. All right, I think we should stop and let's thank Amani again.